Hello, my name is Robert Reed Farr. I'm a professor of studies of women, gender, and sexuality, and African and African American studies at Harvard University. The piece that I'm just about to read to you is entitled, Chant for the Future. On March 25th, 1996, Toni Morrison looked out onto an audience plump with dignitaries unceremoniously packed into the concert hall of the grand John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts in Washington, D.C. From her vantage point, she was particularly well positioned to see the cunning placement of the seven Hadlin crystal chandeliers hanging above the crowd's heads, each one arranged so as not to obstruct the audience's view from the second tier. She had taken the stage to deliver the 25th annual Jefferson Lecture, the U.S. federal government's highest honor for achievement in the humanities. And though by 1996 she was very well accustomed to walking onto the world's most impressive stages, having won the National Book Critics Circle Award in 1977, the Pulitzer Prize in Fiction in 1988, and the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1993, she was nonetheless penetratingly aware of the fact that as she rose to receive the most illustrious praise her country was prepared to offer, that the lovely gifts that she took into her arms came wrapped in paper emblazoned with the marks of the Republic's most profound disability and shame. Each note of triumph for Morrison was sounded through the name of an American patriarch, and though one might ignore the literally heavy-handed peon to raggedy dreams of unending youth represented by the 3,000-pound Robert Burke sculpture of John F. Kennedy in the center's grand foyer, there is no way to easily brush aside the thumping irony of black female Toni Morrison receiving an award dressed in the name of the founding father and self-conscious architect of American white supremacy. Thomas Jefferson. Third President of the United States, author of the Declaration of Independence, first U.S. Secretary of State, and second Governor of Virginia. Jefferson was also the owner of more than 600 slaves, among them Sally Hemings, the half-sister of his late wife Martha. A 44-year-old Jefferson came into intimate contact with Hemings when in 1787 the 14-year-old arrived in Paris to care for, the, for her owner's youngest daughter while he was installed as the U.S. Minister to France. Jefferson quickly initiated a sexual relationship with the girl, and the two would go on to produce at least six children together. This is while the statesman's most significant contribution to American letters, his 1781 collection Notes on the State of Virginia, was blunt in its effort to pair white supremacy and enlightenment rationalism. Indeed, one of Jefferson's most successful and long-lasting intellectual achievements may be the rhetoric he perfected in order to at once rationalize and romanticize the strange idea of an intellectually inferior yet hyper-embodied black American subject. A black, after hard labor through the day, will be induced by the slightest amusements to sit up till midnight or later, though knowing he must be out with the first dawn of the morning. Jefferson instructed the white intellectual elites to whom he directed his comments. In general, their existence appears to participate more of sensation than reflection. To this must be ascribed their disposition to sleep when abstracted from their diversions and unemployed in labor. An animal whose body is at rest and who does not reflect must be disposed to sleep. Ever thorough, Jefferson then sharpened his dismissal of black intellect by quickly dispensing with the idea that the example of a handful of deeply cerebral and sometimes well-educated black people in the Americas demonstrated the possibility that the enslaved, or at least the children of the enslaved, could develop to a level accompanying approaching that of their masters. Speaking of Gambian-born Phyllis Wheatley, the first African-American only the second and only the second woman to publish a book of poetry in the North American colonies, Jefferson bluntly wrote, Religion, indeed, has produced a Phyllis Wheatley, but it could not produce a poet. The compositions published under her name are below the dignity of criticism. On March 25th, 1996, Tony Morrison looked out onto an audience plump with dignitaries unceremoniously packed into the concert hall of the grand John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts in Washington, D.C. From her vantage point, she was particularly well positioned to see the cunning placement of the seven Hadlin crystal chandeliers hanging above the crowd's heads, each one arranged so as not to obstruct the audience's view from the second tier. It seems strange from this distance 
that with all the sparkling grandeur of American history laying naked before her, that Morrison would not bother herself with the enumeration of either the triumphs or the horrors of the past, though she stood at the end of a long crimson corridor haunted by the ghost of Jefferson and the enslaved women whom he raped and slurred, she did not take either the celebration or the vilification of the past as her topic. Instead, she settled her attention on questions of possibility, calculation, benediction, and focus. The speech that Morrison delivered that night, the future of time, literature, and diminished expectations began fretfully. The sage's audience waited and twitched as she struggled between grimness, optimism, shrewdness, and sobriety. We are tentative about articulating a long earthly future, she began. We are cautioned against the luxury of its meditation as a harmful deferral and displacement of contemporary issues, fearful perhaps of being likened to missionaries who are accused of diverting their converts' attention from poverty during life to rewards following death, we accept a severely delimited future. Morrison, seemingly unbothered by the huddle of ghosts that accompanied her onto stage, says with remarkable candor that Americans, enraged and humiliated by our past, dare not turn our faces in the direction of the yet to come. The right in the United States cannot wean itself from a slapdash nostalgia for stale and reeking narratives of a grand country that has somehow lost its way. Meanwhile, what passes for the left in the U.S. finds it exceedingly difficult to do much more than offer ardently complicated critiques of the conservative anti-human social and ideological structures that dominate so much within our culture. The basic and insistent truth, however, is that though we are sometimes capable of mouthing peons to a never particularly well-defined concept of the beloved community, we're ever so much better at diagnosing what is wrong with our country than we are with actually articulating what type of future we might actually want. It is important to note that Toni Morrison died on August 5, 2019, only seven short months before the World Health Organization's March 11, 2020 announcement of the coronavirus disease pandemic. Much of the promise, much of the response in the United States and elsewhere to the reality of the crisis has been to resist at all costs the narrative of defeat that many believe has been the real culprit in the two years of bloodletting that have ensued. Donald Trump, 45th President of the United States and Skion of the Make America Great Again movement, both denied the severity of the disease and sought to associate it with the Chinese, naming it the Kung Flu, while ostentatiously flouting the calls for masking and social distancing and coming from within his own administration, like Jefferson before him, who refused to countenance the idea that there is only one species, all of it vulnerable to the same disorders. He rallied that grand part of the white American public who violently resist the idea that suffering in Wuhan or Milan, much less the suffering of black and brown proto-citizens in their own country, could possibly have a direct effect on them. On March 25th, 1996, Toni Morrison looked out onto an audience plump with dignitaries unceremoniously packed into the concert hall of the grand John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts in Washington, D.C. From her vantage point, she was particularly well positioned to see the cunning placement of the seven Halen crystal chandeliers hanging above the crowd's heads, each one arranged so as not to obstruct the audience view from the second tier. Professor Morrison was rough on her audience that night. Looking into the manicured faces of the country's leaders of government, art, science, and industry, she insisted that the American dream of living longer, more comfortable lives had come at the price of dumbing down our vision of the future, indeed refusing even to imagine a future beyond the duration of a 30-year treasury bond. The result is that we have become increasingly petty and brittle. We turn inward. Morrison claims, clutching at primer book dreams of family, strong, ideal, productive. As a result, we remain continually on guard, submerging ourselves and our community into cults of paranoia and systematic distrust, in which the only way for us to announce community spirit and fellow feeling is to imagine an enemy so vile 
that it can motivate even the unfriendliest of unfriendly neighbors into communal action. The loudest voices are urging those already living in in dread of the future to speak of culture and military terms as a cause for an expression of war, Morrison warns us. Our everyday lives may be laced with tragedy, glazed with frustration and want, but they are also capable of fierce resistance to the dehumanization and trivialization that political, cultural, punditry, and profit-driven media depend upon. The sting of Morrison's criticism is relieved by the fact that the future of time is one of an ensemble of pieces in which the author gives expert instruction in exactly how we might fashion a process by which to imagine a future beyond the rehearsal of the everyday jealousy and avarice that often take the place of human intimacy and spirit. As early as 1983 in her essay, The Writer Before the Page, Morrison asks how one might produce representations of our communities and their futures that are broad and flexible enough to allow for the production of sentences capable of turning the disharmony of our voices into something handsome and beneficial. She goes on to forcefully argue that her compact with her readers is not to reveal an already established reality, but instead to demonstrate that narrative is at its core a negotiation in which truth is established through the interplay of multiple voices, Morrison's, her readers, and their many communities. To state the matter artlessly, Narrative takes place at that remarkable and treacherous juncture where brown-skinned female literary geniuses whisper their names into the microphones of great mirrored halls only to find themselves stunned by the sound of Sally, Phyllis, Thomas, and their many progeny groaning through the feedback. Morrison continued this line of thought in her 1998 essay, Literature and Public Life, in which she argued that literature refuses and disrupts passive or controlled consumption of the spectacle designed to nationalize identity in order to sell us products. Literature allows us no demands of us, the experience of ourselves as multi-dimensional, multidimensional persons. What may surprise even the most loyal of Morrison's followers, however, is just how promiscuous she can be in her efforts to piece together tools to imagine the yet to come. She is consistently hostile to any tendency toward what she names cultural apartheid. Instead, Morrison places philosophy, science, religion, history, fiction, gossip, legend, and rumor all together in one none too tidy bag. Moreover, she is never particularly concerned to justify her voraciousness. Instead, she looks at even the most difficult, most painful, most forbidden examples of U.S. culture, not simply to register her shock and signal her virtue, but instead to see what instruments might be fashioned from the dirty pieces of paper that she holds in her hands. In her 1992 essay, The Source of Self-Regard, Morrison treats at least particularly difficult entries from the early 18th century diary of Virginia planter William Byrd. The Negro woman ran away again with a bit in her mouth. The Negro woman was found and tied, but ran away again in the night. My wife, against my will, caused little Jenny to be burned with a hot iron. I had a severe quarrel with little Jenny and beat her too much, for which I was sorry. Eugene and Jenny were beaten. I whipped three slave women. The Negro woman ran away. The perfectly acceptable an expected response to the mountains of archival evidence of the systematic torture of the enslaved that existed in Africa, the Americas, and Europe, is to to decry this history of violence, to dress it in language that is equal parts red and blue, rage and titillation. Morrison offers her readers no such solace, however. Instead, she remains focused on the mechanics of articulation and counter-articulation that are so very apparent in Bird's diaries. Why, she asks, had that Negro woman been fitted with a bit? Why is the beating, burning, binding, and gagging of slaves so clearly associated in the master's conception of the well-run household? Morrison wants to get in close, to imagine not simply the actions that took place before the bit was inserted, but also what schemes of articulation the slave concocted when the danger and power of her speech were stanched. As we know, 
During her career, Toni Morrison actively used African-American folklore in her efforts to create fuller, more rounded images of black life and culture. What I am suggesting now is that we pay much more attention to the fact that while Morrison was a greedy consumer of the resistant discourse of the enslaved, she was also just as eager in her consumption of the anti-black, anti-human rhetoric of the slavers. She returned to passages from Bird's Diary several times in her career. Moreover, in her 1987 Pulitzer Prize winning work, Beloved, she lifted the story of Margaret Garner, the escaped enslaved woman who attempted to kill her children rather than see them return to bondage, directly from news reports written by white men who seemed incapable of understanding the woman's motivations. The point is that though she was clearly fascinated by the past, she never allowed herself to become ensnared by it. She treats the cooked discourse that arrives to her from the history of the United States not as some inert thing, but instead as a resource meant to be bent toward the needs of the future. Crassley stated, Morrison's challenge to her audience, particularly the American branch of it, is that all of us have no choice but to use the whole of our culture's products, as even and especially the most vulgar of those products, in order to create images of an open or at least serviceable future. When Morrison reads Bird and Jefferson, she does not so she does not do so to remark either their perfidy or her shame, but instead to see just how the things that they have made operate, so that she might take them apart and try to make something useful, something with its face turned toward tomorrow out of them. On March 25th, 1996, Toni Morrison looked out onto an audience plump with dignitaries, unceremoniously packed into the concert hall of the Grand John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts in Washington, D.C. From her vantage point, she was particularly well positioned to see the cunning placement of the seven Hadeland crystal chandeliers hanging above the crowd's heads each one arranged so as not to obstruct the audience's view from the second tier. Thank you ever so much.